Well, I believe it's about time for us to start, so if you'll come on in and find a seat. Well, welcome to midweek again uh, tonight. I think is our halfway point for this semester. So I appreciate all of you who've been part of this class, this gathering uh, during the week. And for those of you who are online tonight, if you have a chance, uh, you might want to give uh, Nick McNabb uh, a shout out. He's the one who makes this possible uh, for you all to see. And I know some of you don't watch it while we're here, but you see it later in the week. And so we appreciate Nick making that available. So again, uh, glad, uh, glad everyone is here. I'll try to make the announcement at the end as a reminder, but remember on Sunday afternoon, this is Fall on the Farm. It was great last year for those of you who were there, and I uh, hope you'll plan to be a part of that. As I understand it, there is a bus coming or leaving the parking lot to uh, help uh, folks who don't want to drive. Uh, but it, uh, I also think the time has been moved up, whatever it is, 3 to 5.30, so that folks can get home before dark. It was getting a little dark last year when it was finished. So everybody has made an adjustment. It should be a great afternoon. The weather looks like it's going to be terrific. So I uh, hope you'll plan, uh, plan to be a part of that. Well, we often talk about intergenerational classes or activities. And sometimes when I hear that term, it, it almost sounds just a little forced. You know, like we're going to put old and young together and the old really want to be with the old and the young really want to be with the young and sort of like putting Lawrence Welk on the stage at Woodstock and, and you just sort of think, oh man, is this going to work or, or not work? And, uh, but we had a really great experience uh, a couple of weeks ago. The um, youth group invited us to share dinner in this room. They hosted it. Uh, their parents served, uh, brought desserts, and uh, after uh, the eating, there was a chance to work through some trivia questions that covered a number of decades uh, so that each uh, generation had a chance to weigh in, kind of like we did uh, early on in this class. Uh, but toward the end of that, Rocky Stone um, gave a devotional thought, and I asked him tonight if I could just uh, use a portion of that to give you an insight to the thinking of the kids in our youth group. These are your kids or kids that you know. And so let me just mention a, a couple of things that he said. He started off, each generation is called to build on the foundation left by the previous one. Psalm 71:18 says, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. And then he said, God also values the wisdom of the older generation. Wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old, says Job in chapter 12, 12. Likewise, Psalm 145, 4 declares, one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. And then this was the line, there is power in generational unity. I thought, well, that's a nice way of saying intergenerational whatever, generational unity. It just sort of speaks to the fact that it isn't old, old, and young, young. It's just older and younger. And together, there's a, a synergy uh, that comes uh, being together. And I think he captured that, you know, understanding the differences, uh, drawing on the strengths, uh, combining experience with energy, learning from the past uh, so that we know how to navigate the, the uh, future. So I thought you might enjoy that. I, it, I started to ask him to come and do it again, but he's part of a group activity tonight. So this is just a little sampling uh, of what we got. Now, I want to thank all of you who sent in responses to the homework question last week. And uh, so what I did is I've, I've tried to compile these on a slide because I thought you might like to see what those around you may have said. I did not attach names to these. I didn't have permission to do that. Uh, but you can make it a game and try to figure it out if you want to. But this is what was, uh, came in uh, from my dad. Do any job assigned to you thoroughly and completely 
the first time. Uh, and then description of uh, her mom. There were no specific phrases. It was more of taking me with her to do good. Uh, then I treasure from my dad's mom, grandmother, her name, which we've named our daughter. What I most treasure about my dad is his perseverance in trial. And then a dad's advice, go to Bible class, you'll meet someone. And then my dad used to always say, better to never marry than marry a bum. <laughs> and then uh, advice from my mom, remember whose you are. And then my Mimi gave me her first engagement ring. She's the namesake of our daughter. So I thought that was a, a, a really sweet kind of combination of thoughts, but it really speaks to the blessing of of generational unity or the link from one generation to the next. Um, and that it, it begins to point out what we want to talk about tonight, and that is that, it, that generational connection is the fundamental aspect of faith, how we pass it on, um, and how we engage the future. So we're going to talk tonight about embracing legacy. Um, the text is going to focus in a minute on the transfiguration, or what we refer to the passage as the transfiguration, which um, it really is just uh, the combination of Latin words that, that speaks to a change of appearance. But when we use it in, in the terms that we'll talk about tonight, it's a change of appearance to something much better, to something more beautiful, something more spiritual. And in so many ways, in a parallel way, that's what we're really trying to do not only personally go through a transfiguration process, but to help our children to do the same thing. I think I probably should pause here and just say, I know the class title says, you know, teach your children well, and we've, we've tried to focus on that. But the, the basis for teaching well is when we understand ourselves, because our children are us, I mean, they are. So when we have it all together, we're operating in all cylinders, the likelihood that it's going to move on down to the next generation is, is much more likely and much more possible. So there is an important event that takes place uh, before we talk about transfiguration tonight uh, that occurs one week earlier than the text that uh, Danny will read for us in just, just a minute. Um, Jesus is with his apostles at Caesarea Philippi. And for those of you who've been there, you recognize that uh, this area, this is a, it was a very pagan area, uh, a lot of worship to a number of um, gods, uh, lowercase g, and that Pan being uh, one of the primary ones who was sort of hedonistic as far as all nature and sensual things uh, were concerned. And it's in this setting that Jesus asks the question, who do men say that I am? And then we know Peter's response. Uh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the conversation continues in Luke. That would be the Matthew passage. But in Luke, he goes on to say, son of man, the son of man must suffer many things. He'll be rejected by elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He must be killed. And on the third day, he'll be raised. And I can just imagine him sitting there and saying, and you guys are in the same boat. If you want to save your life, you'll have to lose it. But if you lose your life for me, you'll save it. And so you hear this collective gulp. You know, I mean, what's he saying to us? And so the tension now begins to build in, uh, in uh, what's coming, not only for Jesus himself, but for those he has chosen to be with him. And then he adds weight to that whole discussion, and it's the, it's the Neil Pryor favorite verse. You know, what good is it for a man, for any of us for that matter, to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Now from Jesus' standpoint, he had just been through this, if we go back to the temptation. He was offered the world you know, by Satan, and he rejected it on those terms. And so now here he is coming back, and he's going to have to go after the world 
to save it. And in order to do that, he has to lose his life uh, for the, the benefit of uh, those of us who are even here tonight and at that time. So Jerusalem is very much on his radar at that time in this conversation. The cross is waiting. He knows that this mantle of responsibility is going to fall on the shoulders of Peter, James, and John. He needs a conversation, I think, with his father. Uh, he needs uh, some assurance. Uh, he needs an opportunity to maybe collect his thoughts, uh, to get the act together. Now, I'm speaking to the human side of Jesus again. This, this class, only deal, we're only dealing with that, okay? And I think at the same time, Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the apostles who've heard this are also beginning to wonder, okay, what have we signed up for? You know, where, what's going on here? Um, and the um, invitation then goes out to Peter, James, and John to go with him. And Jesus says, look, I know the way to the mountain. Um, all you have to do is follow me, uh, watch your step going up, and then you're going to be amazed at what we find on the, when we get to the top. So that's kind of the background for the um, text tonight. If you want to turn there, this is Luke chapter 9, and Danny will read it in case you don't have your Bible with you. About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, James, and John and went up on a mountain to pray. While Jesus was praying, his face began to change. His clothes became shining white. Then two men were talking with Jesus. The men were Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah were shining bright too. They were talking with Jesus about his death that would happen in Jerusalem. Peter and the others were asleep, but they woke up and saw the glory of Jesus. They also saw the two men that were standing with Jesus. When Moses and Elijah were leaving, Peter said, Master, it is good that we are here. We will put three tents here, one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he was saying. While Peter was saying these things, a cloud came all around them. Peter, James, and John became afraid when the cloud covered them. A voice came from the cloud. The voice said, This is my son. He is the one that I have chosen. Obey him. When the voice finished, only Jesus was there. Peter, James, and John said nothing. At that time, they told no person about what they had seen. Thank you, Danny. I want to divide this uh, into two sections for the remainder of our discussion time tonight. And I want us to look at what's involved with scaling the mountain. And the second part of that is what's the experience at the top. And again, set to the um, intention that it, if we understand what it means for us to all uh, work on, on getting our own lives together, how are we going to translate that to help our children uh, understand or go through in their own similar transfiguration? Well, I think it's in, uh, just a, a given that Jesus knew the mountains. Uh, his life plays out in the mountains. Uh, we, we refer to the Sermon on the Mount. We refer to the temptation, the mountain there. We refer to Jerusalem being surrounded by mountains. We know he's on the Temple Mount. We know he's on the Mount of Olives. We even refer to uh, the Hill of Calvary, even though it's not really a mountain at that point. But in this particular passage, there's no reference to which mountain. There's no name attached to it. So in essence, it can be any mountain uh, that, uh, that he chooses at that time or that we choose. So to get to the, the top, I guess you could make an assumption that he just, he and Peter and James and John just appeared at the top of the mountain. I don't know if I ever thought about that, but I don't think that's what happened. I think they had to climb the mountain. I think they had, there was a trek involved that they had to get to the top. And to get there, you know, there were no stairs, there were no elevators, there were no cable cars. 
Uh, it took some effort, it took some risk uh, to get to the top, and there was a value in the climb. You remember it took three days, roughly, for Abraham to get to the point of sacrifice, Mount Moriah for Isaac. You know, in three days, what happened to Abraham? You know, it was the climb that made the difference. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he had three days to think about it. And then he gets to the point and he has to make a decision when, when his son is laying there on this altar and his hand is raised with a knife. He didn't necessarily make that commitment on the front end. He, he could accept that he had to do it, but he had, to, he had time to work through that. The intensity of it, the responsibility of it became more intense as he went along. Climbing the mountain for this group, you know, is, is a challenge to fears, to anxieties. You know, if you're afraid of heights, you know, the thought of going up the mountain, that's a little daunting. Um, but the blessing, there was no urban noise. There were no pop-up ads. There were no commercials. There were no billboards. There was really just silence in the way nature provides silence and an opportunity for either thinking or conversation between Jesus and Peter, James, and John, who would have been the only ones present at the time. All right, so the, let's assume that they, there was a process of getting up the mountain, and they get to the top, and now they have an opportunity to engage in this conversation. Who's at the top? Well, God's waiting, and the first thing that we hear that Danny read is that Jesus launches this conversation. Okay? So in the form of prayer, uh, I mean, we would refer to it as prayer, but there's a dialogue going on here. I can only speculate what might have been in that. You can draw your own conclusions. But if I were in that position, I would, I would be talking about what was on my heart, what I was dreading, what the load was that was coming, what I knew I had been asked to do. Um, and I, we know later on that he is going to ask that question, is there another way to do this? Of course, the answer is no. And I'm not sure but what that wouldn't even have been part of the conversation at this point. I know what's yet to come. I know where we're headed. Is this the way that it, it needs to go or is there an option out? Um, I think he probably had an opportunity to say, um, you know, this is, a, this is an anxiety producing responsibility uh, that I've been given. But as that conversation goes on, it, it must have intensified. And again, you realize I'm speculating about all of this. This is in my imagination. But it must have intensified to the point that the relationship shifts a little bit. And God now becomes uh, involved with what's happening there. And it's an intervention of sorts. Now, when we use the term intervention, we usually think of it in a negative way, that there's a terrible behavior, and so we're going to have to intervene to change it. But I'm using it in this term to say that he recognized that his son had a need, and he's going to intervene on his behalf. And so what he does is he summons two mountain men, men who were very much at home on the mountains, to come and to intervene on behalf of his son, Moses and Elijah, because they were, they were survivors. They knew the rule of three. We put that up there last week. I mean, they've been in the desert. They've been in the mountains. They know how to, to, to do what has to be done. And they had also been challenged with very superhuman expectations by our estimation. If you just look at the things that each of them were asked to do, would we do it? Would we believe that we could do it with that? But they succeeded against overwhelming odds, and their power, of course, came with their relationship to God. And whatever they needed, it seemed as if they found it in the mountains. I don't want to make more of that than what it is, but it seemed to be a meeting place with God in that situation. So God orchestrates this intergenerational um, intervention here. Now, who was Moses when it comes to talking to Jesus about all of this? I mean, here's the older generation talking to the younger generation. And he, I, I, and whether he says it or whether it's just known, there are huge similarities uh, between the two. The first part of each of their lives was spent in preparation for the second half. 
uh, he had, Moses had spent time on the mountain. He spoke to God face to face, one of the few people described as having had the privilege to do that. He was saved from infanticide. It was launched by Pharaoh, just like Jesus had been spared uh, under Herod's edict. Uh, he was trained by his mom, really. We don't know a lot about his dad. So the influences, even under the nose of Pharaoh, came from his mother. Uh, he had a very close connection to God in the mountains. So the burning bush on Mount Horeb, the number of days on Mount Sinai. He sees the promised land from Mount Nebo just before he dies. He worked closely with only just a few folks, his siblings, Aaron and Miriam, and Joshua, his aide. Just a, a few chosen folks. He took advice from his father-in-law, who told him, you know, look, the load's too heavy. Divide it up. Uh, you don't have to carry this all by yourself. He lived life with a very rebellious, unappreciative group of people. He took them as close to the promised land as he could get them and then let their choice make the decision on what to do after that. So the conversation, any conversation that Moses had with Jesus, there was credibility. He had done or been a part of everything that Jesus was about to have to do. Now you spin it over to Elijah and we almost find a similar situation. The mountains are very familiar to him. Mount Carmel, where he has the standoff with the prophets of Baal. Uh, Mount Horeb, where he hides from uh, Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, to be spared from all of that. He worked with a vision given to him by God that was, um, that required him to do a lot of it by himself. Uh, he met challenges head on. He faced death more than once. Uh, he questioned God's will. Uh, in fact, at one point he says, take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he ascends into heaven in plain sight. So when it comes to what do they have alike, there's a lot. I mean, they're sitting there. These aren't just two random people off the street that just happen to be hiking on the mountain and they sat down and had this conversation. God brought people to Jesus to mentor him in an intergenerational experience that was credible. The past meets the present meets the future in that. And what do you think they did? I think they told stories. I think they just, they sat and they talked about how things had been in the past and what was going to happen. And they could speak with credibility about that, how he would feel and how faithful God would be to him because they had lived it out. They knew what was coming. And so after a bit they leave. Peter tries to engage in this impetuous way that he always does. And God responds a second time with words that he's already used at the baptism. And he says, this is my son whom I've chosen, or in another passage, whom I love. Listen to him. Do you like me? I love you. Am I worth anything? What you've just said and what you're about to say is going to be really valuable. Will I make it? You're my son. You're my son. And you're more than just a survivor on this mountain. And so at, at that point, he, he's, done, he's answered the three questions again. And if you look at this, he does it in all five love languages. In just that one little sentence, if you go back and look at it real closely. He gives him words of affirmation. You know, he's valuable. He affirms him. He encourages him. He gives him gifts. By the time he finishes with this, he's got a different perspective about what he's got to do. He gives him time. He's there in the beginning when he's talking to him. He's there in the end when they get done. He doesn't abandon him. Full focus. He gives him an act of service. He's the one who arranged the intervention. And then he has physical touch. I think one of the few times where we see this, it's, a meta it's almost metaphorical in its way. But if you look at that, generally the power of God is underscored by power some image of power. It's the pillar of fire out in front of the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness. Or um, for Elijah, it's that prelude to his appearance with the wind and the earthquake and, and uh, all of that 
uh, natural disaster that goes on before the small voice. But in this situation, there's an expression of love, and I think of tenderness. It's, it's sort of tough and tender all combined in this cloud. For Peter, James, and John, the scripture said it was frightening. But for Jesus, it's his Father who wraps this cloud around the group in what I think may have felt more like a hug or an arm on the shoulder that, that basically says, you guys, this is my son. He knows what he's doing. He knows what I want him to do. And you just listen to him. Now, that's a, that's a very affirming kind of way to let someone know that you have great confidence in them. And so when he gets done, it says the cloud, you know, he disappears. Peter and James and John are awake. They now realize what's going on. Jesus says, don't tell anybody what's, what's happened. But the end of this, at the end of this, Jesus is coming off this mountain knowing that his father has his back and that he can do what he has to do. Now, again, that's my imagination, okay? This is, a, this is just my way of, of bringing a dimension to this story, not, not that there's any place that you'll ever find this written. But I do all of that to try to bring um, a personality to what's going on here, because the question now is, how do we take our children to a mountain of intergenerational activity. How do we do that? Since there's no identification of a mountain, we can do this however we want to or wherever we want to. And I think it's more significant because it gives us a glimpse of what it looks like to do this. So how do you connect to legacy? Well, I tend to think that our mountains look more like a tell, uh, an archeological tell. And, uh, you know, that's, that's an artificial mountain, really, in a way. It's just layer after layer of debris. The closest thing I can think to around here are the landfills in North Little Rock, there where you take the, the road around to the airport, and that's what they are. You know, it's refuse, dirt, refuse, dirt, refuse, dirt, and it just builds up. And now, if you've watched that over the years, there are two pretty impressive uh, hills there. But in a sense, that's the tell. Communities require water, food, and defense. And if you do that really well and you've got a great triad there, your community begins to look really great to outsiders. So if somebody wants to invade, I mean, they're gonna go after the ones that, that offer the best. So you'd have two options. You either submit to the invaders or they level you. And so as time goes on, we build layer on layer the water, the nutritional source, the defense don't go away, but the communities do. And so someone comes in and takes advantage of those and builds a new one, stacks it up, and the hill gets bigger as it goes on. So how do we create a family tell, a family mountain? Well, I think it begins with family, obviously. This is sanctioned by God from the beginning. This is the way everything is supposed to operate is within family dynamic, and it's what connects generation to generation. Without family, there aren't generations. So that's the given. That's the base of the mountain. And then each generation adds its own experiences, the successes, its failures, and its dreams that were either fulfilled or not fulfilled. Okay? And then that generation gives birth to the next one who stands on shoulders until they collapse and they add their own layer. And then it happens again and it happens again and it happens again until we build a mountain very much like a tail develops. Okay? And when it gets up high enough and we've had enough generations that have contributed so that we have a history and we've built a legacy, we now get up around this great cloud of witnesses of ancestry from the past who has a story to tell, successes and failures, the goods and the bads, the things that make family, family. 
um, as they're connected. The mountain really is any place that we can gather to tell a story. It's a family reunion is really what we're talking about when we go to the mountain. We hear the stories. We learn the DNA of us individually. We learn the DNA of our family. How is our family put together? As you go back and look at these layers, you're, that's what archaeologists do. They dig down through this. And each layer gives you more story to the one above once you begin to understand what was going on at that time. Uh, for those of you who have been around a while, you'll remember that the American Studies Institute about 30 years ago brought Alex Haley to campus. It was when Roots uh, was big at the time. And he talked about, in his presentation that night, really his family mountain. And it had to do with the fact that on, in the evenings, he would sit on the front porch down or on the steps, and he had a, a number of aunts who would sit in rocking chairs from about the time it got dark until it was time to go to bed. And they would just rock and talk and rock and talk and tell the stories about what it was like when they were little, how they'd survived, the, the memories that they had. And in many ways, just listening to those stories was that generation passing on to him who then passes it on in the, the book. Those of you who know the book know the story, know how he traces this all the way back and, and comes forward. We do it with photographs. We do it with trips to cemeteries. Any place that triggers a story is part of uh, introducing our children to legacy. This is current as of yesterday. Um, Anna, our youngest daughter who homeschools, usually begins each semester with some sort of field trip. And so they went to DC. And while they were there, they went uh, stopped to, uh, to look at the um, memorial to the Korean War. I did not realize that there were names on that memorial, uh, the Vietnam Wall we all talk about, but on this one as well. And she texted me and she said, it's Billy Jean, right? And this was the picture that she had taken. This is my uncle, my mother's brother, just older, who was killed in Korea just shortly after he was deployed there. And so she had, while they were there, had found the name and had taken the picture. But now, in that little moment, in that one picture, she connected my uh, uncle to me, to her, to her children. She dug down through the, the tell to find where the, those connections and the stories that go with them. So there's an opportunity now to begin to introduce the legacy in moments uh, just very similar to this. Anytime we go to the mountain, though, we're really, in a sense, geocaching. How many of you do that? How many like to, to do that? A few of you, Evie, some of the rest of you. They, had, You know, this is designed to try to get us out of the house, to get us out into nature, and it operates with hidden boxes or, divide, or uh, packages that uh, have GPS coordinates. And you can go online and find where they are, and then your job is to treasure hunt. You try to find them, but there are rules when you do this. And when you get there, there's a log book. You have to sign saying that you've been there. And then you have the option. You can take an item that's in the box, but if you take it, you have to replace it with something. So when you go, you, you take small things uh, you know, to be able to put in the, the box. But when our children go to the Mountain of Legacy in very much the same way, they find the box and they take out a new perspective, they take out an understanding uh, that they maybe didn't have before, and they leave behind doubts or discouragements or uncertainties or uh, just that whole, um, where did I come from? Who, what's my past? Is it good, is it bad? What does it amount to? All right, so with all of that as the background, what should we teach our children if we're gonna make the climb up the mountain? You know, what is it, how do you get the most out of a mountain climbing experience, basically? So these are some random things. Uh, you can do, draw your own conclusions whether you think they're valid. But I would think the first thing that you want to do is you want to climb your mountain, not a molehill. 
Um, mole hills are really just little mounds of dirt just created by the mole under the surface. They have no substructure. They have no foundation. You know if you step on them, you squash them flat. Uh, there's nothing to them at all. And so when we're talking about climbing the mountain, if we only get as far as the mole hill, then we really don't have the complete picture. If they get locked down and all they know are the disasters in the family, all they've ever heard you talk about, it's all the negative things, all of the, the weird ants, all of the, the people who, you know, we've all got irregular people in our lives, and if they're the topic of conversation, that's all they know. So they, they climb only so far because they don't expect to find anything higher up. This is about as good as it gets. So we need to keep them off the mole hills and get them up higher so that they can get the complete view. You know, no family is a total disaster. No family is totally perfect. Now, if we get off the molehill and start moving a higher up, that's an invitation to questions. So we have to be willing to answer those. It means talking about people that we'd soon forget or we wish they weren't part of the family tree. But they are who they are, and they are part of us, and so we just need to lay it out there, fill in the gaps, and know that we don't have to be stuck we don't have to be uh, to make the same decision. So you have to go high enough up the mountain to get the whole picture. Uh, the second thing I would suggest is go up, you know, make the climb. And as you go up, grow up uh, in the process. Brad sent me an a article last week. I referenced this, but it's been intriguing. And I, I've spent a couple of days this week trying to validate something that was in it. And I, it has been fascinating to me. Uh, because it talks about the difference in personal experience versus protected exposure. And there's a huge difference when you talk about the development of brains in children, the prefrontal cortex part of the brain, which, by the way, is the last part of the brain to mature. Okay? So as you're thinking about that, what is that doing? That's reasoning? Hmm. 20 before that's mature, okay? That's problem solving, that's perseverance, that's impulse control, that's all of those behavioral things. And so what your prefrontal cortex is doing, it's gathering up all the information that's coming to you from other parts of your brain. It's trying to assimilate it so that now you have a repository of information on which to draw in order to make good decisions. But it's not maturing until early adulthood, okay? Well, the it, um, emphasis in this article is that if, if you as a child have more engaging experiences, you mature your prefrontal cortex in a better way, not only in a positive way, but even faster because of that. I was trying to think of some way to illustrate this, and so if this is a stretch, I hope you'll forgive me, but I, it, it made sense to me, and if it's this. If you remember the miracle on the Hudson, uh, the, the, Sully, the pilot, had to make a decision about where to land after the bird strike on the plane. And if you remember what followed, and it, and it probably, the movie probably puts the TSA in a, in a bad light. I'm not sure they were that antagonistic. But the idea was, should he have made a different decision? Did he have time to get back to the airport instead of landing in the river? And if you remember how they tried to make that decision, they brought in all of these pilots and they put them in simulators. And they created this artificial situation. And for a long time it looked like Sully was wrong, 30 years as a pilot with experience. And yet in the end, when it became apples to apples, his decision making for all the years of being in the cockpit, making those decisions, proved to be right. And the simulated experiences were not valid. So I, again, I realize that's a little bit of a stretch, but it made sense to me that if that's what it takes to mature us, our thinking with that, then we need to let our kids play outside with their imagination. That We don't have to, to provide everything that they need, you know, and scrapes and bumps and broken arms are just gonna be part of that. 
but that's an experiential way of, of learning with that. Maybe it's uh, when it comes time to take elective classes. You take something harder than what you normally would. Maybe it's when, it's, if you're a musician, you choose something harder to play than you normally would. There's a challenge that's built into this. If you've grown up privileged, maybe it's time to go work in a, in a homeless shelter one day a week or to take a mission trip to some part of the world that's very, very different than what you're accustomed to. It's how we begin to build a legacy within our family that's going to add another layer to, to understanding. You know, we've talked about FOMO before, fear of missing out. There's another uh, acronym, fear of messing up, FOMU, uh, which is now very legitimate. And I think the point is that no family is free of mess ups. It's just important that our kids understand that and that we, have, we allow them to uh, learn from their experiences. Um, this, I think, you could always come back to. Uh, they all know the Lion King story. Um, and in that moment when Simba has sort of lost his way and forgotten uh, who he is and what he needs to be doing, uh, what is it that Mufasa, the generational connection, says to him? You've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten us. You know, we invested in you, so look inside yourself. You are more than what you've become. You raise the bar. You, you bring them back to what it is that, that's important. I saved this. Um, our daughter, Allison, uh, about 20 years ago, was trying to make some decisions, where to live, what to do. And I asked her for permission to read this tonight. She wrote to us and she says, sometimes it's easy to feel overwhelmed with all of life's uncertainties. Life's purpose is about seeing how I fit into God's plan, not how he fits into mine. Now that rolls off the tongue a whole lot easier than putting it into practice, but I'm thankful each day for another opportunity to try. And I think that's that go up, grow up. You know, yeah, maybe it doesn't always go like we planned, but we're going to keep climbing. We're going to get to a different spot. Well, here's another one. You've got to climb past the past. Uh, the uh, choices, maybe we don't always make good choices. Maybe we fall off the trail. Uh, but we can't get paralyzed in the memory of those bad decisions. You know, we have to get on We have to climb on past that. Um, and maybe it means a visit from Elijah or Moses. But if it does, you remember this too. You know, here it's Simba kind of whining about things and Rafiki whacks him in the head. And he starts complaining, and he says, all right, that's in the past. Forget about it. And it hurt. I get it. But you can either run from it, or you can learn from it. I think the Lion King is a very teachable uh, venue for lots of these things that we're talking about. Um, the, this one is uh, Meet Me at the Top. And that is the tendency is to say, oh, it's too dangerous for you to climb. So let me hold your hand, and we'll go up the mountain. But I think the opportunity is for us to offer the fact that our ancestors, our legacy, they've already driven pitons in the mountain. All we have to do is hook our carabiner to it to get on up. That saves a lot of time, saves a lot of energy. If there are already pitons in the mountain, you just click and go, click and go. And then you descend with determination, which means that if we've gone to the mountain and we've really had this shared experience together, we ought to leave there feeling renewed, feeling really rejuvenated and excited. Um, let me move on here. Uh, we're going to get close to the end. I, I almost didn't put this in because of current events, but this was already in the works. So let me just speak to it. With all the things that are happening in Israel right now, this is Masada, uh, Herod's palace, the last fortress held by the Jewish uh, resistance before the Romans took over. But it has become the symbol of Israeli nationalism. And for the forces that train, they have three months or four months of basic training and then three months of advanced training. And then uh, certain ones of them will make a 31-mile hike, starting at 8 o'clock at night, hike through the night, and then climb Masada uh, at, at just after sunrise. They take their oath of allegiance to the country at that point. This is the climb. And then they're given a green beret as a symbol of having accomplished that. 
But the important part of that is that they, the, the mantra that they take with them is what you've heard before, and that is that Masada will not fall again. And it's almost the same sentiment that we need to have when we climb with our kids, that we will not let this legacy fall apart. We won't let this family dissolve. We're gonna do whatever we have to do. We're gonna keep climbing. We're gonna correct. We're gonna give a hand up. We're gonna clamp into the pitons. We're gonna do whatever we have to do. Masada will not fall again with that. So where does that leave us? Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. And so, in summary, if we help our children understand that legacy is built on layers of the past, and that's good or bad, it is what it is, but it's built on layers, and one layer does not define who we are. We have to have them all to look at them. That family failures and successes are what educate our choices, what help us to make better choices than maybe the generations that, that preceded us. And that any trail that we take up that mountain that leads us to the sun is going to connect us with God at the top of the mountain. Now, if we do that, then we will have taught them to embrace the whole concept of the value of legacy with that. So, just as a reminder, this Sunday, uh, 3 to 5.30, hope everybody will be there. Weather's going to be great, great chilly, um, and uh, a lot of things to, that give us an opportunity to add one more layer to legacy because we all shared it together. So, hope you have a great rest of the week, and thanks for being here tonight. Yeah.